Right. Thanks for having me. Um, so, Blendle. Who know? Who's heard of Blendle? Okay. Who uses Blendle? Okay. Not bad for Sanoma. And who paid for Blendle with real money? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Pretty good. Okay. So what what we try to do is is uh, uh, this. Um, we try to help you. Oh, uh, it was way too fast. So I do like animations, but they do go wrong. So we uh, <coughs> try to help you discover and support the world's best journalism. So discover, we have like a lot of content from, from I think, 120 publications in our platform. Um, uh, so that's where the discovery needs to happen. And then there's support by, you know, letting you pay easily. That's at least the idea that you can just pay without thinking too much about it. Um, so this is what we're trying to do. Um, there's pretty much two ways you can pay for content on Blendo. There's this thing called micropayments, which we started off with. Uh, you just pay per article, and in this case, I don't know what you paid. You paid 89 cents. It's hard to read, but it's there. And you can ask your money back. So if you didn't like it, you say, okay, I didn't like it, give me my money back. And then you say, okay, the article wasn't what I expected, or I clicked accidentally, it was too expensive, or it was too short. So people can just get the money back, and just when they, when they click that orange button, they would get it back. So that's what we used to do. And now since January, we have Blendo Premium, where we, you would have a monthly subscription of 10 euros, and then you would read your personal selection for free. So it would be 20 or 30 articles a day, approximately, which we select for you, and which you can then read without paying any extra for it. <coughs> okay, so that's the ways you can support uh, uh, journalism. We are active in three countries, in uh, the Netherlands, Germany, and the US, since about a year now. Um, we have over a million users. One in five is paying with real money, so the score here is a bit better, it seems. Uh, we have 80 employee employees, approximately, of which 15 are uh, journalists. So these are people that, that actually read much of our content or read much of, of the, uh, the, the newspapers uh, and make pre-selections out of these newspapers. And we have clippers. Um, so these are people that cut and paste from PDFs. So some of our publishers <laughs> yep, uh, <laughs> um, uh, deliver some of their content in, uh, uh, in PDF, and that, that's due to well, the publishers and us not uh, connecting the things uh, in the way they, they should. But we don't want to be stopped with that, so we have people that cut and paste from PDFs. Uh, um, we have 30 of them. They're mostly students that work part-time, so it's not that bad. Um, <coughs> yes. Yes, it's, it's horrible and it goes wrong. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, we want to get rid of that. Um, <coughs> we have about 4 million articles, and we get about 8,000 new ones every day. Um, and we have things we call events. You're probably familiar with this concept, but we have about 1.5 billion of them now, I'd, or approximately. Uh, anything you do on any of our platforms, so for instance on, on, uh, on, on, on our website in the following timeline, anything you do, we would send something like this home to our servers so that we know what you did. So any click, sometimes mouse movements, pretty much anything. OK, uh, what do we use it for? We use it to make rankings better. That's pretty much what I'm into. Um, and this is one of the most important rankings. It's a newsletter that we send out every morning and that surprisingly many people open every morning. Uh, so it has a really, really high open rate. Um, I don't even know exactly, but it's, it's incredible. So people read the stuff that we send them, and we make selections so that they keep doing that. Uh, we have timelines, like this one, the following timeline, or the trending now timeline. We have, at the end of an article, there's this related article thing, so things that you might also want to read after reading a certain article. And we have search. So if you search, we also make rankings. Uh, and we uh, 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 can try to, to make these personalized as well. All right, <coughs> so just a little bit on, on the content that we have. So this is a well, probably familiar graph, head, tail, curve, or zip flow, or whatever you want to call it. So on the left, there's a few but very popular articles, and on the right, there's many but not so popular articles. So a guess, what's there? All the way on the right, not popular. We have lots of it. The long tail. The long it's the long tail, but an example of an article that would be there. No one. You guys are doing content here. No. 
It's a colophon. <laughs> Uh, so we have many colophons, uh, they're one sense, uh, no one wants to read them, especially not from the Lewaard um, <laughs> Courant. They're one cent, right? Uh, so no one would do that. Um, okay, and then there, on the left, easier probably. Story. Story. Yeah. Close, close. So it's sex uh, from the Linda. Uh, I th so the images are removed. Um, but yeah, there used to be images there as well. So that's very popular, we don't have too many of those. Um, <coughs> the point is that neither of these are very interesting. The one on the right you would never want to see as a user, the one on the left, well, you get easily bored if we would only send you stuff like that, right? Sure, we could, and we might actually do that. I don't know, honestly. We, we don't look all the way to the right, but it's there some somehow. Um, so here in the middle is the more interesting content, for instance, this about football, which <coughs> some users really want to read, but many users don't want to see ever. Uh, so you have to figure out that this is about football and that a certain user wants to read it or really doesn't want to see it ever. Um, and then a bit more obscure, maybe, about the migration of eel. Um, well, most users will never want to see this, but some would really like to see this, right? So you need to know a lot about your content, about your users, in order to be able to do stuff like this, to recommend things like this. So, what do we do? So that's why we need to personalize, and this is, well, how it starts. So these are our journalists, or a selection of them, um, <coughs> and they uh, get up at 5 in the morning, reading all these newspapers, and then when they're done at 8, uh, they have this selection, pre-selection, which we use uh, to select articles from that we sent in this newsletter. So this is where personalization starts. So they make a pre-selection. And we have two to three or four hundred articles sitting every morning waiting to be, well, uh, ranked for each user. All right, <coughs> then how do we rank those articles? So our problem is not 8,000 articles, it's just a few hundred articles that need to be ranked. What do we do? Well, we have a bit of an issue. Um <coughs> And the issue is called cold start. It's new content. No one ever used it. Users didn't see it, didn't interact with it. It's completely fresh. So we need to handle that somehow. Um, we do that by using learning to rank techniques. Um, and we have a bit of a timing issue. So as I said, these, these editors or these journalists, they wake up at 5 and at 8 they're done. And that's also pretty much the time when people are commuting to work. So that's pretty much the time in which we should have been sending that email already, right? You, it should just be waiting in the mailbox. So these three issues, this is what I will be talking about. Um, yeah, and you will see a slide like this when I switch to uh, another. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's the first one, cold start. So <coughs> we get these 8,000 new articles every night. Newsletter is an important driver. So we don't have any information about the popularity of our content yet. So that's what we're dealing with. So what we do, Oh, right, and this is just to illustrate that people want to read stuff from today. So on the left, that's the number of reads from content from today. And then it decays really quickly uh, to older content. <coughs> right, so what we do, we have this enrichment pipeline. And, well, first thing we do is we detect the language. So we get very little metadata from the providers, hardly anything. And if we get it, it we cannot always trust it. So what we do is we just throw it away and do it ourselves. Um, so we detect language, we tokenize, we measure stylometrics, so we measure vocabulary richness, word variation, length, uh, I have some examples coming up. Um, we measure the sentiment, so we just pretty much count positive and negative words. Um, we do post-tagging so that we can do named entity recognition, so we recognize locations, persons and organizations, pretty much like any standard pipeline. Um, we extract the author. We do semantic linking, I have an example of that as well. And we do top topic modeling. We, it's not on this slide, but we also do, do geo, location, extraction, and things like that. So we, we just keep building and extending this. All right, um, so this is an example of, well, an article as it comes in from my perspective. So it has been normalized to blend all normal forms, so to speak. Um, and this is also an example of our documentation. So this is a cucumber feature. I don't know if anyone knows cucumber features. Yeah, not bad. So yeah, we document 
uh, everything with Cucumber features. It's not just documentation. You can actually run this documentation, execute it. Um, uh, and so for every change that merges into master, it needs to pass all these, uh, these, these tests. And we have many of them. So this is just an example. Uh, it's this article from Het Parool, uh, The Drunk Vegetarier. Um, it's a recipe, pretty much. Um, yeah, so what we extract is this, if it goes through this pipeline. So we extract the author and the language. We extract the stellometric, so we know the number of paragraphs, the length, vocabulary richness, the number of images, and complex things like Hapax, this Lego, Mena, which looks, I believe, at the number of syllables. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's something like that. Um, <coughs> And then we extract things like this. So these are links to Wikipedia. Uh, and what we do is we just download Wikipedia. And we look, for instance, at how often the Wikipedia page for Avond, Maaltijd, Supper, uh, is uh, linked by the word dinner. Uh, and if you see that occurring a lot, then at some point, if you encounter the word dinner, you can be pretty sure that it means supper. So this is what we use to link to Wikipedia. It's just entity linking. Um, and once you have that, you can use this other really cool feature of Wikipedia, which is that there on the left. So if you have the, the Wikipedia page Avon Maltite, it links to all these other languages, and we pick the English one so that we know that this page or this article, even though it was Dutch, was about supper. Um, so we have this representation of this Dutch article, that it's about supper, thick, flat feet, vegetables, soybeans, whatever. Um, so if we know that someone is able to, well, is interested in soybeans and is able to read Dutch or English, we can just, you know, start, 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 start recommending articles like that. Um, right, and then we have named entities. Tom Kellerhuis, which was also the author, uh, but he's mentioned, I think, and others. Um, right, so that's about enriching an article. So as soon as an article comes into Blendle, this is what happens to it. Uh, and then we have this batch process, <laughs> which runs every night, which should be streaming, or at least it should be both. Um, uh, and I think we need to use Beam for that. Um, but um, uh, we, 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 we have something like this. So uh, we have a user who read these two articles. So these are, I shrunk them a little bit, but these are two of these enriched articles that were read by this user. And then we, what we just do is we say, OK, a user apparently likes these things. So these are articles that the user read and didn't ask the money back for or didn't give negative feedback on. And then we say something like this. So this user is able to read Dutch. <laughs> he did it once. And able to read English. He did it once. Um, he reads from this author and that author. He reads articles that have a mean article length of 2,000 something uh, characters. And we do this for all our enrichments. So at some point, you get a pretty rich profile of what users read. And also, and I didn't illustrate it here, what they saw and then didn't read, or what they saw and, and read and asked their money back for. So we have all these, these aggregates per user that we can then use to, to do recommendations. All right. So recommendations, learning to rank. So <coughs> I'll first talk about supervised learning and then about online learning which I indeed did my thesis about and tried to run here at Sanoma at some point. Um, now I'm doing it at Blendle. Right, so online learning. So we have this user, and we know that this user saw an article and bought an article. It's just historical data. It's, say, a month old data. The user saw that article and bought that other article. Um, and we have another user and who also saw an article and bought one article. So these we call training examples. These are preference pairs. We say, OK, for this user, this article, the article that was bought, is preferred over the article that was only seen and not bought. Um, so what we do is we pull these articles through this enrichment pipeline. We have these profiles, rich profiles of these users. We just have them lying around, or we recompute, that, recompute them for the day that we were collecting the data from. And then we extract machine learning features, as we call them. Uh, and these are things like this. So the author of the Item was in the top three of the authors uh, of the user. Like the user likes to read from this author. That's pretty, mu pretty much what it's supposed to say. Um, the user is able to read this language to a certain extent. Uh, the user likes long articles, and this is a long article. Um, so things like that. <laughs> 
right? Um, and then we apply something that's called the pairwise transform. Uh, if you don't know it, just skip it. If you do know it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and it pretty much turns this problem into a classification problem. You can pretty much predict what the right order of two articles is in a, in a preference pair. So you can say, okay, this is preferred over that, or that is preferred over this. So that, that's pretty much what you do, and you can just use any uh, classification algorithm for that. So we used SVM from Sparklib with a linear kernel to try and predict this. Right. So what you get out is a model, and if you use that model, it's simply feature weights. So weights for each of these features that I showed on the previous slide. Um, and then when it's early morning, 8 o'clock, and you have this user and you want to know how to sort or rank these, these, these items for this user, what you do is you enrich these items and you get the user profile. You extract these same features, apply a ranking algorithm, and send this ranking to the user via email or whatever. So <coughs> this is what we used to do for a while. Um, so we tried and used many models. I showed S SVM, but we used Lambda Mart, which is a more sophisticated learning to rank model. Um, we tried others as well. We used months of historical data, so it turns into billions of these uh, uh, examples pretty quickly, actually. Very repeatable, so you can always repeat these experiments and try another model and see how it performs, or what kind of accuracy you get, or whatever. Um, but very biased. I'll get to that in a second. It didn't really work easily. I mean, we get good scores. Right? These models perform really well on these data sets, but not necessarily online on real users. So this is called supervised learning, and the other end you have online learning. So, so far we've only be de been dealing with simpler models, uh, log linear and linear models. Um, you can use others, but we didn't get around to it yet. Um, so one issue is that the data cannot really be collected. You're running the experiment while the user is interacting with the system. Uh, I'll show how that works later on. Um, it's not repeatable because, as I said, you need this running system and the user at the same time at the same place. So you cannot just store data and, and replay it uh, with a different model, for instance, to try and how it would work. But it's unbiased, and this is, this is the main reason we are, we are going down this route right now. So what do I mean with unbiased and biased? That biased data on the left, that months of history data over there, that was collected using some algorithm. So if now I have this new algorithm that starts producing or recommending this new item to a user, but the user never saw it because the other old algorithm never produced it. So the user never saw it. The user had never had a chance to click on it, even though it might be the perfect item. So you would never be able really to beat that, 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 that algorithm that you use to collect that data. Does that, does that make any sense? Yeah, you could say that that on the left you're n you you're not able to escape it. Escape it. Right. Yeah, you could say that. Uh, here, though, it, it, it's pretty straightforward. You just have this new algorithm that produces this new article that the other algorithm would never recommend, but you just show it to the user and see whether the user would like to read it. Right here, you have the user in the loop. There, you don't. So this is the road we are taking right now. We are not completely down the road yet. It's running uh, now, but I will show you how it works. So, as I said, we have this pre-selection of uh, uh, articles that are selected by our editors. So usually this, this is a list of about two, three hundred articles. And then <coughs> we measure these things like, okay, does the user like the author of this article? Or um, does the subject of this article, for instance a Wikipedia page, uh, match the subject of the, of the, of, of the user? So for instance here, this is a column, a column? No, how do you say that? Opinion piece, whatever, uh, from Sander Donkers from the Vrij Nederland, and apparently this is a user who really likes to read that, that particular opinion piece. So <coughs> we have many of these features. So uh, I showed some before, so the user likes it long, the length, um, uh, the author is in the top three, um, the user can read this language. Uh, and many more. Uh, popularity is one that we cannot use for also re reasons I mentioned. Uh, we just don't have it yet early morning. There's no such thing as popularity yet. Um, okay, so but I stick to these two. And the question then becomes, how important are these? And as I said, that we're using linear models. So this is pretty much what these linear models can do, right? So we give the author weight, and then it's just sorted by author. Uh, 
we give the subject weight and it's sorted by the subject. And the question just simply becomes how to set these weights. Um, so what we're we doing, we're using online learning. And uh, I have this beautiful visualization for that. Um, so what we do is we have this dartboard and we throw darts for every of our users. So we have, say, a million users. So every morning we throw these darts and <coughs> uh, they land somewhere which is close to what we currently think is the best place for this dartboard to, dartboard to be. Right? So we make a small perturbation for every of our users and then the users get their, their email or their timeline or whatever ranking they're interacting with based on this slightly different setting uh, which is just for them. And then what we do is we observe where, where users are happier, pretty much. Uh, and we have signals for that, right? We have this, this refund signal, we have the read signal, we know how much time people are suddenly spending on Blendl. So we can see that, 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 that in some areas uh, on this dartboard, things might be better than in other areas. So highlight it with the size, and then what we do is just move the dartboard there. So next day, everyone gets their new um, uh, 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 weight setting. And at some point, this will stop moving. We also shrink the dartboard a bit, actually, so the learning rate uh, uh, goes down. Um, and then when it stops moving, what we do is we just use that. And we would think that this would be the optimal ranking for this user, given this limited linear model, obviously. Um, so we could just send that, but we don't. We call this relevance. So okay. This is just sorted by relevance. We computed the relevance for each of these documents for a user. Um, so we could just sort by relevance and, and, and send that to our users, but we don't. What we do is we diversify. So we say, okay, this first item we'll certainly send. This is just the most relevant thing for this user. We'll send it. Then we look at the similarity of the rest of these items. Um, and we look at how similar they are to the item we decided we are going to send anyway. Uh, and we compute. Uh, like a, a trade-off between relevance and, and similarity. So this item is still quite relevant, but not very similar to the thing that we already selected. So that's why it is the second item that we sent. Um, oh, they're off anyway. You get the idea. Uh, so we, s we, we, we say, OK, these fir first two items are the ones that we're sending to you, and then we compute the, rel the similarity to all other items. And we just keep doing that until we have a ranking that we are sending to you. Awesome. And then we don't send this either. We send this. So we prepend this with must read. So our editors have some power there actually, and they can well, they can highlight or, 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 or select three articles that they think everyone should read regardless of their interests. Um right. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, bubbles. Um, so this, you could call this a bubble. It's personalized for you, filter bubble. That obviously isn't. So we make these bubbles by taking your history into account and your onboarding signal. So when you onboard on Blender, you say, I like this, this provider, or I like this channel, or I'm interested in this and that. Um, and we use your explicit feedback, but then we sort of break it again by, by uh, having this editorial pre-selection. We have these must read things. We diversify this to make sure that it's not just about football, if you happen to like that. And we couldn't take popularity into account, which sort of prevents this echo chamber effect as well. Um, what I would really like to do is go a bit further in the other direction and add something that's called your bubble, which would be, well, uh, not pre-selected by editors, but be really based on, well, on, on your niche uh, preferences that we extract extracted from your reading behavior. So it would be, <coughs> this is the your bubble for Alexander Klipping, my boss. And so he's into drones, he's from Oz, and I don't know, something about startups. Um, and, and this is stuff that you couldn't really send to all of our users, but you, sh we, you could send it to him. We're not doing this yet, uh, I just wanna, wanna go into that direction. Okay. Right. And then the third issue that I wanted to talk about, uh, which is timing. So, yeah, so as I said, our editors wake up at 5 and they're done reading at 8. We cannot force them to get up earlier. 5 is really early. Uh, 
uh, and they cannot read faster than they do. So at 8 they're done, and that's pretty much when we should have been sending the newsletter. So we have to deal with that issue somehow. Um, <coughs> True. So, for the PESH group, for instance, we are able to read earlier. Only yeah. yeah, 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 sure. Th and also, uh, magazines can be read during the day. Yeah. But, but still, there will be stuff that's only present in the morning, always, uh, and, and there's always this time constraint. Um, sure, I'm exaggerating uh, a little. Um, right, so what happens when... when, when uh, content gets delivered, for instance, at 11 in the evening, uh, it gets published to a Kafka topic, which is pretty much a pops up um, uh, a channel, what you described earlier. Um, so, if we're so who knows what Kafka is? Okay, so what, it, what you can, so this topic is something that consumers can subscribe to. They can listen to a topic, and then there's publishers that publish to a topic. So, this topic is pretty much just you can see there's a queue where things get put on, and then there's workers that read from this queue and, and handle those messages. And it pretty much has the same uh, characteristics as you said before. Things are d delivered at least once. Um, so it can be delivered more than once. Um, so here is this enrichment pipeline. It's in one, one of these consumers. So articles get published to a topic called articles. So this vertical thing is a topic. And then there's an enricher, which is a consumer from that topic and listens to that stop this topic and reads an article from it and then enriches it. Um, we have several of those running in parallel. They actually run on Docker, on the Kubernetes, and these run, these scale up and down depending on the workload. Um, so this is what it looks like. This is production code from a while ago, uh, the list of and Richards that we're running right now became longer. It splits over many more lines now. Uh, but this is pretty much what it is. And it, it's reading from standard in and writing to standard out. That, that's what it is, which makes it awesome because you can really easily test it on the command line. You just you know, pipe uh, an article into this enricher and get out what you also get out in production. Uh, so this, is, this gives us a lot of flexibility and makes it really easy to test things. Right, enough production code. So we have this um, topic where articles that are uh, enriched are uh, uh, published to, and then we have a persister which persists to Elasticsearch. We use Elasticsearch upsearch, and the idea is that there's constantly a stream going into this Elasticsearch database, which you pretty much just use as a database, uh, and the idea is that the articles in the database are as up-to-date as possible. So this happens within seconds after publishing. Then when these editors, early morning at 5, uh, pick an article, what they do, they annotate this article as well. So they, they, they put it into channels, we call them, and they say this is a very complex article with a dark feeling, um, and this is the title sh you should be using. And well, they annotate it, and all that stuff, all the annotations also are persisted into, into this Elasticsearch through the same topic. And there's other updates, for instance, if uh, articles uh, are shared on social media, we actually store that in the same way as well. Right, and then for these articles that are picked by our editors, so this is a sub-selection of all our content, we publish it to yet another topic, then we compute these features for this article, so for instance we compute the complexity of the article, so the complexity features or the length features, um, and then we compute for each of our users, so we have this database, Elasticsearch again, um, with our users, which is filled with a batch process, but we're moving to a streaming infrastructure to fill that. Uh, we need to duplicate our code for that, probably. Um, so what we compute here is for each of our users, for each of these picked articles, the features for, for, for this combination. And then we have uh, our rankers, our models. So it could be this batch learned model, for instance, SVM linear model that we learned before, or it could be, uh, uh, right, or it could be uh, this online model that we trained using this online learning model, uh, online learning method. Uh, so we have many of these models just sitting there uh, uh, and we just enable or disable them depending on what experiments we're running. Um, and then for each of these models, we compute a score. And the score is persisted to Redis. Um, 
Right. Yeah, so here you have the number of updates to articles that are picked. So typically on a day, this is just a few hundred uh, uh, messages coming in on this topic. But then we have our users there, and we have more than a million, so say a million. Uh, so we have a few hundred times a million messages on that topic. And then <coughs> there we have that times the number of rankers we're using in production currently. So on any given moment in that Redis store, we have a few hundred million scores sitting ready. And these scores reflect how uh, relevant uh, uh, an item, an article is for each of our users. So for each of our user item combinations, we have this score. And we can just use it whenever we would need to rank these items. So that's what we do. So it's 8 in the morning. Uh, the editors are done reading this new uh, re reading. Um, and then they hit the button and they publish their newsletter. They write a newsletter with an intro text and outro text. And they publish it. We select the right users. For instance, for the Dutch newsletter, we select our Dutch users. Um, and then we have these scores, which were computed on the previous slides, and they're just sitting there, ready to be used. So we don't have to do this expensive feature calculation anymore. We don't have to apply any potentially expensive models anymore. It just sits there, ready to be used. So pretty much what we need to do is just get these scores and sort by score. Well, I told you already we don't do that. We also do this diversification. But, but that's pretty much what, 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 what we need to do. Um, so yeah, there's one newsletter a million users, Oop. Oh. right, um, and we run many of these things. So as I said already, we run each of these consumer producers, we run them in Docker containers. Um, <coughs> so that bit of code that I showed you before, that was pretty much just wrapped in an image, uh, and that, that's all that runs in that container. And then we orchestrate this with, with Kubernetes, so it's a Google platform to orchestrate your containers, uh, and it makes this really, really easy. Uh, do you guys use it here at Sonoma? No. Yeah, uh, it makes me really happy because it gives you this auto scaling, for instance. So if things become really busy at certain times, it can just scale up and down again when it becomes quiet. This is one of the things that I really like about it. Um, we currently run, I think, 36 of these personalized bundle pods, as they're, they're called, uh, in parallel in production right now. Uh, in the morning, yeah, if it's busy. Um, and this is where we finally decide on experimentation. So we have an experiment API where each of our users is either in or out an experiment, and depending on whether they're in or out an experiment, uh, we select uh, uh, scores from a certain model that were stored in, uh, in that Redis store. Um, yeah, and then we have this personalized newsletter, which is published to a topic, and then there's a process th th that just wraps it in HTML or whatever way you do that with email and send the email. Um, and the idea is that this happens at 8, and this is done at 8.15. Well, that is partly true. Uh, it sometimes takes a bit longer. But the cool thing is that uh, the first user gets their email shortly after 8. Right? So this is a streaming process. So what we can do is we can select uses in a certain order that make sure that the users that need their email first get them first. Um, so that we do that. We know when they open their email usually. Right. So we have a histogram in open times and we just know whether people need it early. Yeah, we do. Process? Yeah. And do you then have uh, present old articles that might be interesting? Ah. Uh, so no. So our editors, when they select an article, they say when it expires. Um, so depending on the newsiness of an article, it might stick around for a day or a month. Um, so things that stick around for a month, yes, uh, whenever it suddenly becomes relevant for a user because we see that they start reading stuff about it, then it can show up. Um, but but only then, yeah. Right. So this is what I talked about. Cold start, which is why we do enrichments. Learning to rank, uh, supervised versus online. We used to bet on supervised, but had issues 
uh, getting the performance we wanted uh, when we when we faced the models uh, showed the models that we were using to our users and now we're betting on online um, no results yet sorry it's running uh, i have to wait about a week i think um and then i talked about timing so pretty much what we do is we pre-compute things as soon as it's possible that's pretty much what we do our stack which is always changing um, but we are using Spark for processing large data. For instance, these user profiles are made in batch, and we do that on Spark. Um, we use Python 3 everywhere. Um, we use MLib, not so much anymore. Uh, our content, the truth of the content, is on S3 still, even though we moved most of what we do to Google. We also still have Amazon Redshift, because there's no alternative yet at Google. We use Luigi for plumbing, and we just connect lots of our Spark jobs together and, and whatever have you. Um, we have scikit-learn mostly for experimentation, but it's running sometimes in production if we just want to try something out. Elastic, um, but mostly as a database. Redis, if we re need real fast access, for instance, for these scores. Kafka streaming, to pretty much glue this whole streaming infrastructure together. Docker and Kubernetes for containerization. Am I missing something? Oh yeah, Cucumber for behavior-driven development. Be there's a D too many, I think. Anyway, um, <coughs> yeah, so I highlighted in bold the things that I didn't really know before before I started working at Blendl uh, that I really like. So this Cucumber is the first thing that I encountered when I started working at Blendl. All of Blendl, also the non-data stuff, is documented with it, and it makes it really easy to for me to look into other parts of our code base and understand what's happening and run uh, cha change something and run their tests and see where they break and uh, and be able to read stuff so i highly recommend it so docker and kubernetes i talked about it gives me as a data scientist a lot of flexibility i can just spin up new machines without talking to anyone else uh, it's also a bit scary maybe for the ops people which we don't really have anymore since we moved there um, and Kafka, because it's just pretty much incredible, the, the volume of data it can handle. Uh, I've seen close to 50,000 events a second going through it without any issues on just a few machines. That's it. Thanks. So, questions? Always at the top. Ah. Uh, yeah, you're talking about the bubble and then getting people out of it. But I can imagine that it then is a company that wants to make money. So do you take the amount uh, article cost and how much the user spends in account? No. So yeah, so first of all, we want to just make journalism possible. Um, uh, and no, we really don't look at pricing of content at all. It's completely in the hand of uh, our providers. Uh, they can change these prices and we have like we have usually price records so the longer articles are more expensive and the, the, the shorter ones are cheaper but but how cheap and how expensive is completely up to uh, providers even though we usually show them that uh, cheaper articles well sell better uh, but 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 no we don't take it into account in any of our algorithms never no. Not a question. Um, yeah, I don't know a lot about your providers, but are you using um, or what? Uh, are you handling fake news now? Yeah. Also. So I guess we're sort of lucky in the sense that it's easy for us. So our providers are, well, you guys, for instance, Pers Group. Um, not many of our providers publish fake news. I mean, there might be something slipping through the cracks sometimes, but but <coughs> so. So <laughs> our, 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 our content in general isn't, is pretty good already. And then we have these editors that make this pre-selection of things that we finally end up sending. Um, they are journalists. So, they, so you know, there's a journalist writing the piece, then there's an editorial board or whatever you want to call it of, of the newspaper uh, that it gets, has to get through. And then there's our journalists that read it. So there's quite a few layers of humans that could potentially uh, catch it. Yeah. No, 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 no. Not all articles. <laughs> <laughs> Not all articles go through the hands of our editors, indeed. Yeah. But the ones that we put in this newsletter, for instance, they do. 
Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. So also the the ones that were in the selected for you like are the originally picked by editors. Yeah, okay. just the ones that yeah, okay. that in this little bubble that we didn't implement yet that I want to implement and the rest of Blend I don't know, but I really would like to be make that. Th those wouldn't be, uh, but that would be big warning signs, uh, like explaining that that that's an algorithm selecting them and not users, uh, not humans. On a, on a selection. Yes, exactly, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, do you see a difference in this is mainly like newspaper content, right? right. Uh, do you see well a big difference between uh, magazine content yeah. and newspaper content? Yes, yeah, so exactly. So it's magazines and, and newspaper. Um, I mean, obviously the magazine content just doesn't go stale as quickly as newspaper content, but that's just its very nature. Um, there's a couple, I don't know, it's, it's not that clear cut actually. So there's big differences between providers in general. Um, so some are just read much more than than others. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the Groen Amsterdam is is extremely popular. It's a magazine, but people just want to read it all the time. Um, yeah, I don't know. It is. It's not that clear cut. The story. Yeah, we, we found out from our numbers so that we're getting from you guys. Yeah, this is your type of is content. Of what can I say? Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> one of the most popular ones. <laughs> yeah. uh, like people's guilty pleasure reading yeah, about yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, Yolanda's yeah, yeah. new haircut. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We might want uh, uh, an incognito modus for uh, reading uh, these <laughs> yeah. kind of things. That it will not end up in your profile. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, I don't know. We'll see. Any other questions? Uh, Hans. Are there any ideas to expose the filters and the subset yeah. for the user itself? Because yeah. then he has also got the yeah. possibility to yeah. interact. Yeah. So uh, we released a feedback on channels and providers today. Uh, so now we, when you say, okay, I don't want to read this thing, then you can say, okay, why not? Well, because I don't want to read the story. Um, so this is released today, and, and right now it's only providers and channels, we call them, but this will extend to, for instance, also authors, and uh, whether you like lengthy articles, uh, and things like that. So I have a master's student right now uh, working on this. She's writing a master thesis on it, um, and she's putting it into production, so it will be there soon, I hope. Yeah. Um, how many journalists are working on that uh, editorial filter that you said? Uh, Fifteen. Fifteen. So five per country. Yeah. Aren't you afraid that they create their own bubble? They will. <laughs> yeah, they obviously will, right? Like edi any editorial board. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah. Yeah. Just but yeah. How do you select uh, the uh, these? Uh, well, tools? I don't. But um, we try to have a diverse group of these people. Yeah. Yeah. Final question. Yeah. yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned um, you you were moving for certain services from Amazon to Google. Yeah. Can you tell us? Or are you allowed to tell us why? It's cheaper. Yes, uh, it's just financial. Yeah, now yeah. until we move probably and then these guys will make it more expensive, but yeah. right now it's cheaper. Um, no, of course not. Uh, plus, um, so some of the services are just easier to handle. Uh -huh. uh, so this Kubernetes, for instance, well, they didn't, I think they have it now on Amazon, but they didn't have it when we moved. Um, and it's extremely powerful. Um, yeah, uh, spinning up nodes is way faster at Google than it is to spin up an instance at Amazon, for instance, like way faster. Um, so yeah, I don't know. So for now, it's just giving us benefits. Yep. Yeah. All right. So then uh, please a round of applause for Anna.